everybody uh we are on with the first twitch stream thing so it's me sitting here doodling and uh spirit on keeping all the cameras rolling and things because i don't know anything about technology so yeah <laughs> hey guys <laughs> he'll also be uh moderating our chat i guess so sort of keeping keeping me up to date with questions and things I'll have it running in the background too. So I guess we could start off with if people have suggestions for what to draw. First of all, could... you guys probably hear, hear some music and stuff. Is the sound correct? Just trying to find out if can you hear us properly and is the music too loud or is it okay? Some feedback on the road. Sounds great for me. Okay, good. At the moment, there is no music. Yeah, it's a perfect volume. No, there should be music. Spit it on. You are pitch perfect. Boom. Low music in the back. Yeah, yeah probably you have to pitch it a bit higher if you don't hear anything. We don't want to make it too loud, but, you know, some atmosphere. All right, let's go. Yeah, Evan is supposed to be louder than me. <laughs> Just... Oh, am I not loud enough? No, no, um, you are, you are louder. In... You are you are louder than me. I, I I said it that way because people are supposed to listen to you, not to me. Yeah. All right, let's start. Yeah. So I guess you'll just read out the questions as they yeah, like, come in. Yeah, I think you wanted to, to get some suggestions of what to sketch, right? Yeah, so if anybody's got something, uh, you know, shout it out. Do you ever sketch without anything in mind, even Evan, or you always have a plan or goal? I, sometimes I'll, I'll doodle, just, you know. Um, just throw things out without really thinking to start with a shape or something. But most often I try to go in with a plan and, uh, you know, like I tried, I tried to be as efficient as I can when I draw. So I try not to sort of do too much thinking on the page. I try to like have all that done when I sit down to draw. You have a suggestion, which is orc creator. Orc creator. All right, let's start with an orc creator then. And people can throw in other ideas when once they come about. I like doing orcs because they can really only be so complex. Like you can design them really complexly, but truly, an orc is just an a agent of chaos. <laughs> Oops. Okay, there we go. So he's a raider, so he's got to be. Sort of good at carrying off loot and stuff. Um, should try and think of, off of other warriors and adapted. But he's supposed to be a raider, so they have to be sort of lightly armed and armored, which makes them more interesting. Or greater. <laughs> Question: Are we gonna see the bastards in video form? <laughs> Ooh, oh, uh, there would be. I, th I think that might make uh, Dan cream his pants. Um, I get. I I hope they're talking about the backwater bastards. In which case, uh, like you know, I think we'd be very happy to see that. Uh, but um. Uh, I don't know if we know any animators who would be able to take that on, but that would be amazing. Uh, but I think probably at some point at the in the Patreon, if we can, if you can wrangle the vote, I would love to do sort of like a real rendered uh, round of like the Backwater Bastards. That would be amazing fun, I think. 
Mm. Did you have any artists that you looked up as inspiration for developing your cross counter drawing method? Or did you figure that out by yourself? Cross contour drawing method. I can only really guess exactly what they mean there, but um, huh? Cross hatching, I guess. Yeah, that could be it. But I think the person who really sort of like as as with most people, I started by drawing like silhouettes. You know, like you start with just like focusing kind of maladroitly on the outline rather than the volumes, uh, and I think. Claire Wendling kind of took me out of that pretty efficiently when I sort of found her work and started really studying it and looking at it. Um, and then, you know, as you do, like you, you discover some new hero and through that you rediscover an old hero. So then going back and sort of re-examining uh, Paul Bonner sketches, I like had my mind blown about how how he would discover and he would explore every like piece of uh, three dimensionality in his characters, so that even though they look really weird, they'll feel like they could, you know, move freely, which I think is really important with his pieces. So yeah, I think the <clears throat> those two really like pull that out for me, like drawing inside the shapes. Mm -hmm. Could you inc uh, could you increase a bit your drawing area on the stream, please? Yeah, probably just make it like full scale so they can see it bigger mm. yeah, yeah like that like that yeah all right um yeah you have some more suggestions like an orc raider falling in lake from great height or a witcher piece um a witcher, please. Oh, witcher. <laughs> witcher. Oh, the witcher. Yeah, yeah. So, so this 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 orc raider will definitely have killed the witcher. <laughs> That's he's like an anti-witcher, so he goes and hunts witches, witchers. Jay says, um, perhaps not a fan art piece, though. Perhaps a hybrid, such as half orc or creature of a dualist nature, such as a satyr. Really beautiful pieces, also made, and hoping things are good. Thanks, man. Um, I, I don't really like these sort of chimera designs, but I like the suggestion of the satyr because it gives me an idea, which is, like, let's make make a element of the orcs of this world, whichever world this is, that they have, like, these almost comically oversized feet so that they would walk kind of like the way a satyr would, where their ankles would be mounted much higher on the foot. That can be interesting. Then they can move differently. So then we might have something interesting. So good, good, good idea there. That was that was that was cool. But I agree. I don't want to do like a specific fan art, so this won't be your bog standard uh, orc. We can kind of figure out together what these orcs will be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just throw out your questions, guys, if you have any. What is, in your opinion, the hardest obstacle an artist must overcome in order to get better at art? Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's 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 keep it simple. Uh, that, <laughs> Jesus, um, that that is very individual from artist to artist. Um, I think, um, if I can if I can sort of vary the question a little bit, I would say the most important thing to learn as coming up and becoming an artist is to sort of figure out that there is there's no shame in not knowing there's only shame in not uh, being willing to go and explore so like a lot of the reasons why people end up with art blocks for example is that they get into a situation where there is a visual problem they don't know how to solve um, 
And we all come into that situation, but then there are kind of two ways of responding to it. One being, as we often are when we run into an art block, like indignant about the fact that we don't know how to solve a problem. And then that struggle becomes a struggle of sort of our own pride uh, overcome by our own lack of faculty or at least lack of expertise. Um, but I think the important thing is to then sort of learn that reflex of like, oh, here is something I don't know. Let me go and study it. Demystifying art. I think it's or de demystifying the craft of um, of drawing and painting and these things. I think it's the most important thing because once you realize that they are sort of reliable tools, then they're not like like for me when I was a kid, I had this sort of uh, relationship with art and with the craft that it felt like magic because it was so hit and miss whether or not I succeeded. And I think when that went away and I realized that it's just a tool, um, that really opened a lot of um, of gates for me. Another question <clears throat> is, hey Evan, using the Intuos Pro, I am. Any tips for drawing on it? Ooh, uh, defocusing. So, especially when you're working on Intuos, it's because of that hand-eye relationship. It's real difficult to not, uh, or to get, to get sort of a, a comfortable relationship with drawing. Though serendipitously, serendipitously, painting becomes much easier. So one of the key reasons I got into painting, uh, as opposed to just being a pencil jack, was was having an intuit and sort of finding that painting became easier when I learned how to focus on the thing I was doing rather than the activity of drawing, like the thing I was making rather than the activity of drawing. So the individual line being perfect was no longer as important as the thing that I got out of it. But if you do want to get into drawing on an Intuos, then you have to learn to sort of look away from the specific point where you're putting down lines um, and focus overall on the thing that you're trying to draw. Uh, and um, yeah, essentially be okay with fucking up some lines because Intuos is not made for drawing. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't make interesting and cool things, but that, that uh, line quality question becomes a pure reflection of how comfortable you are with the tool. So just, you know, the more you can use it, the more you can be aware of the challenge and not let it discourage you, but just sort of find your own techniques for how to draw straight lines and how to draw, you know, smooth curves. That's important, I think. Another question is, um, hey, Evan, any plans for the next personal project? Yeah, I mean that's kind of what we're running with the with the Patreon is uh, a little bit so that I can um, sort of <laughs> get people to push me out of my comfort zone a little bit so I can try and do these uh, uh, polled characters like right, right now we're doing uh, Wolverine. It's really fun. Uh, another wise is to sort of allow me to take a little time away from from work, from freelancing, and focus on making more time stuff. So we're sort of through that. We, we're starting to. I, I'm I, I'm putting together a bunch of characters who are central to the story, um, and so that's part of the release schedule too for for the the Patreon. Uh, and I think little by little we'll we'll see you know some of the story coming up there and like larger illustrations and. Uh, and at some point, hopefully, we'll con collect sort of the key parts into into another book that's more story driven and more um, sort of world building. Yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> yeah. And there's also, if I may chime in, um, there's also the uh, currently a sketchbook in the works. Which, um, oh yeah. Yeah, which will be put together. We scanned like a thousand five hundred pages from his old sketchbooks. <laughs> and put, put together a couple of uh, couple of volumes with uh, a best of, and also release some of them on our Patreon um, to make it sure that you see everything. So if that sounds interesting, you might want to want to check out the, 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 the Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have some more. Have seen in all of your artworks that the anatomy and posing skills are insane. How did you develop this? How did you learn it most properly? Okay, so there is this guy called uh, Andrew Loomis, right? And he is amazing. He did one of those 
um, classic breakdowns of anatomy into basic geometric shapes sort of deals. Uh, and he compiled it in a bunch of books. And you can find them all free online if you just Google Save Loomis. Um, and it's it's a variation on what the, the, the Hogarth method. Um, which is also really good, but I prefer Loomis because it teaches subtlety over like over dramatization. But uh, the really important thing that he does is to sort of teach you how to create a basic three D uh, engine in your head, so that you can try and sort of analyze things into making sense three dimensionally. Uh, and that really simplifies anatomy a lot because it makes it easier to um, to compile the, the shapes of of the human or the anatomical body. Um, not just through one schema, but through a sort of understanding of how those shapes intermingle so that you can try and move them around in your head and it still makes sense. So Loomis is definitely super important. And then life drawing, drawing, like going out, finding people who are doing interesting things and drawing them doing that really helps with understanding gesturing and um, and movement and just like subtle things too, like go to a cafe and just draw people drinking coffee for a day and you'll start understanding like the the importance of like subtlety and movement so there's a lot of stuff like that like um and I, I do think that the intermingling of sort of the theoretical and the practical are what makes interesting shape languages like an understanding of underlying mechanics and then using those to express some sort of vision I think that's that's what makes things interesting. So um, anatomy can be pretty dry and pretty boring to learn, but if you can put it into those kinds of frames, then it can be really fun. Mm -hmm. We have another one. Your character and future sketching is so free following, uh, flowing, sorry, but you must have done academic study of proportions and anatomy. How much did you do study of proportions and anatomy? Oh, a bunch. Like we had, we had, I was, I was oh, fortunate was slash. Was, I was, it was figure sketching, not future sketching. <clears throat> oh, okay. I was, I was going to ask about I that. Correct himself. You were actually, no, it's, it's okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. No, so, so I had a, had the good fortune of having a very skeptical art teacher uh, in high school who more or less told me and my best friend to our respective faces that we would never amount to anything because we didn't. Uh, want to get into like modern sort of abstract art um, and I, I think that was like one of those mean jokes to try and like get us out from being like pretentious manga sketch artists and and try and like get us to actually study uh, and it worked because we both went like <laughs> we both found Loomis the next day and just like went pretty crazy with it so um, that combined with a lot of life drawing a lot of uh, um, still life drawing um, was kind of the basis and then when I got to art school um, there was a lot of the same but with a teacher who more wanted to focus on uh, teaching us what we were seeing rather than just sort of directly inferring it which was cool so she would sort of explain how muscle groups worked with each other to create different shapes and different stances and that sort of thing so that was really neat um so yeah, I've done a bunch of those things and I still try and do it as often as I can. I think part of the thing we'll be doing on these streams is studying. Um, so I'll be picking out things that you know I'm struggling with for a piece that I'm doing. Um, and depending on, on, the, on the disclosed nature of that piece, we might show it or might not, but I'll explain the problem and then sort of explain why I'm studying individual things. Um, so yeah, studying never stops. You have to keep doing it. Do you think Instagram fame overshadows skill in this industry by boastful baron? <laughs> um, Dan, is that you? No, um, I don't know, honestly. I know that th there are a bunch of people who are extremely Instagram famous, um, who, you know, might be more famous than their skill warrants. And, and conversely, there are a lot of people who deserves a lot more recognition than they get. But I don't know if that's particularly Instagram or if that's social media altogether. Um, I mean, the, the, I, to a greater degree now than ever before, but it's always been, you know, whoever knows how to take advantage of the current 
media landscape will get more out of it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily specific to um, to Instagram. I think that's more social media in general. Let's get this guy's chin under control. It's getting a little crazy. Um, Sophie is asking, how do you approach the animal studies you did recently? I mean, you do anatomy studies or more like acting. Really love the pops and burps. Um, so I think part of part of studying is to sort of figure out the information you want to get out of a piece or out of a piece of reference. Uh, and then studying as to understand that piece of information. So a lot of what I study when I study from reference is gesture, um, simply because I, th I find like anatomy at some point, you kind of get it. Um, well, most anatomy, anatomy that is, is, is transferable to an understanding of human anatomy. So I can understand the anatomy of a horse because most of their muscle groups are, are similar to human muscle groups, just, you know, changed somehow. But I can understand how they involve themselves with each other, and I can understand how they move corresponding to one another. Um, wow, I've totally forgotten the question. <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> um, let me read it again. Um, how do you approach the animal studies you did recently? In the new ah. animal studies, you know, that stuff. Yeah. So, so yeah. So the anatomy study thing is kind of. It's more um, going back and re revising anatomy knowledge based on what I'm seeing at the moment. So if, if there are little sort of visual shortcuts I've been using, then maybe I want to revise it and try again um, just to make sure that it's still working. Um, but so one of the things that I really do have been trying to focus on more lately is good gesture, because that's always been a problem of mine. I, my, my characters... Um, I've, I've, not, I've not been great at sort of being able to have an intuitive relationship with, with gesture. So that's kind of been a focus. So that was a good spot um, with those studies because they really were about like how, how they act rather than how they're constructed. So you see, like if you really look, you can probably find a lot of anatomical mistakes in those studies. But the, the action and the, the sort of movement and stuff is kind of what, what I was going for. My voice is very clear. Um, I'm sorry for that. That's on purpose. <laughs> um, oh, there are so many questions. Apparently, I overlooked one. Hey, Devin, do you read something from Brandon Sanderson? Oh, uh, I've, I've, I've been told to. Uh, and I guess I'm just I'm a little slow. Or when I, <laughs> when I get the chance, I sometimes forget. Um... I have. St I don't know if that's been the center. The Wizard's Apprentice or something like that. I did start, and I. I don't know. Like that. There was something about the world building and something about like the feel of the story, that I had a hard time with, and like the hero, kind of didn't catch my imagination much. But um, that might be someone else. But I. I have heard really good things about Brendan Sanderson, and I do want to sort of figure out what it's all about. So, um, yeah, no, not yet, but I, I am planning on, on getting to it. Mm. I saw that you make quite a lot of magic cards. How come you didn't share these on ArtStation? I've always been curious. Oh, that's no particular reason other than, like, I, when, whenever I came to think about it, I think they're all been released now, except for the ones that I'm working on now. Uh, so, when... I sent them in for, you know, as the finals for the commissions. The horizon at which I would be able to post them was so far away that it kind of skipped my mind for a while. And then when they started being released, I just, I was busy. I wasn't paying attention. So they didn't, they weren't released then. Or I didn't, I didn't post them up then, I mean. And since it's kind of just been like a thing I should be getting around to, but haven't yet. So we should probably put those up on the art station or something. Yeah, I make, made a note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, a, a lot of the a lot of the activity you see around uh, from my part is is spirit I'm going like we should do this. And I'm like, yeah, I suppose we should. I can't be lazy anymore. <laughs> Damn it! And same same person. Novi is also saying uh, your Rakan and Zaya sketches for Riot are incredible. Mm, um, thank. 
Did you have a schedule for streaming on? Is this going to be an on and off thing that you're going to do from time to time? We haven't really discussed this, right? No, but we well, we did a little and said sort of we should try and make it a weekly thing. Um, so I think I think sort of the first the first goal to hit is to have uh, routine enough where we can make this a weekly thing. So I think that's going to be the first goal, and then. Perhaps we can sort of hook it up with something from the Patreon or something and try and make it more often. Yeah, we were discussing also to have um, Patreon-only uh, streams, specific ones. But yeah. in the end, it was something that should in become something like once or twice a week. But it all, all depends on how much time Heaven can take off uh, his regular work, right? Yeah, I think I think sort of the general being like the better the better these kinds of projects do, uh, the more time we'll have to dedicate to them. So the more we can, the more we can then put into it, so that it becomes kind of a a self or not self sufficient, but some something that kind of builds itself by its own success. Yes, yeah, so that's the word. Yeah. Sometimes words are hard. You're welcome. Hey, Evan. Thank you by Shensan. I love your work. Question. Back then, when you started out your character per day challenge, how did you manage to do it beside work? I currently work in-house and I only have two hours in the morning lunch break and after which is only about four hours a day. It feels super slow to develop my character. Any tips? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, have a plan when you sit down to draw, essentially. Like, I... I wouldn't say that I was being remiss in my work duties when I was doing it in the beginning, but... Um, I would, I would, you know, just make sure that I like when I when I otherwise would have been going on Reddit or, you know, checking Twitter or something like that. I would rather set aside time and sit down and like think about like the theme or the idea that I had for that day. So you know, I would give myself little cues, for example, and then just start thinking on it and try and come up with something clever and interesting and something that I felt like, yeah, this is worth that time investment. And then in the evening, I would have like you know, in the beginning at least, sort of an hour to three hours and then you know as the year progressed and i started putting more time into it more and more time but um the the, the general rule of thumb was sort of like what i said then spun off into my general work um focus which is like never go to draw unless you have an idea in your head so like i was kind of fortuitous that you guys suggested this work hunter dude because i already had uh, like ideas that I'm going to be using for this uh, and things that I've sort of been been toying with like the nature of this guy's hair for example it's been a thing that I've been wanting to put in discussion for a while um, so I will always have like little a, li a little um, set of ideas and things that I want to test out and things that excite me so that when I start drawing I'll <clears throat> I'll pull on that as much as from like the the reference gallery that I have in my head and try and like find interesting things to put down on paper so that I have things that excite me about the thing that I'm about to do. And that, 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 that really helped sort of keep that momentum alive through the year. Mm, another question is, you mentioned life drawing in cafe, etc. How do you approach mm -hmm. life drawing moving people? Oh, um, with extreme abandon. Uh, you are you you learn a very sort of rough um, lesson after a little while, um, which incidentally um, bears in with the reason why I started using ballpoint pens almost exclusively, which is like you have to just be willing to throw a good drawing on the wind and then let it fly away, um, because you're not there to draw pretty drawings. You're there to study. You're there to learn. So. Essentially, the nature of that question is how do you make sure that your drawings come out good even though people keep moving and that fucks up your drawing? Well, then you have to draw quicker because you're not trying to draw a pretty drawing. You're trying to draw and study a particular aspect. So what you have to do is just be specific in the information that you want to get out of a sketch or out of a study, I mean. So you look at a person and you tell yourself, you know, oh, this person has an interesting face or an interesting nose or the way that that hand contorts to grip the coffee cup or like a specific element that is important for the study. And then you focus on that. And if it's not enough time, then you might have been too um, elaborate and too sort of grand in your, in your ideas for the study. So then you might have to go back to the next one and say, okay, I'm just going to focus on this finger. And then you focus on something that's small enough 
that you can sort of en encompass that. And then you always try to push to do more per study so that um, so that you don't stagnate on like things that you've already mastered. But essentially, the quicker you get and the better of a um, visual shorthand you develop, the more you can draw in a shorter amount of time. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to move physically quickly when you draw. You should try and draw quite slowly, but just so that you minimize the amount of mistakes you're making. But um, make statements that are specific and are thought out and that, you know, do something that you intended to do. Um, Will is asking, are you influenced by Lion Decker? Uh, I think everyone's influenced by Lion Decker by some degree. Um, I mean, yes, of course. How not? But um, not actively. Like I, 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 you know, a couple, couple of times a month, everyone I think <laughs> pulls out some Lion Decker. But um, he's seldom in my mind. He's more of sort of a, a, an influence about how effectively you can solve a complex narrative problem, which I think is extremely important about his work. Um, I love the cleverness of Landecker uh, in the same way that I love the cleverness of uh, Rockwell. But um, yeah, I don't pull on them sort of actively. It's more, more like a general uh, inspiration for cleverness. So much Which of I say, I oh, sorry, I, <laughs> I, 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 uh, just, just just say that's something I aspire to. It's not something I feel like I can really lay claim to. Um, Jay's asking, so much of the nature of fantasy is that it presents a sense of escapism from reality. Although arguably success as subject as it is, often manifests from that dichotomy, I hope I get these words right, and congruence between the real and unreal. Considering this, where would you place such a distinction that is the interplay and that amalgam between the familia and the novel? Ooh, that is a very good question. So this this kind of goes to the heart of something I wrote about for Firestar not long ago, which is what's called the common fantasy universe. Um, and you all know what it is, right? It's the thing that has orcs and goblins and halflings and all the tropes live in the general fantasy universe. So when we talk about fantasy in general, we talk about this. Um, and I think um, you know, I, th I think that balance is. Um, the, ba the balance of, of the recognizable and the novel is an extremely fine line to walk, um, and I think it goes to. I, th I think I think the the point at which it's successful is the point where it makes you re-examine or rediscover something that has nothing to do with fantasy. So the novelty of fantasy is when fantasy can teach you something that's applicable to the real world. I think. Um, so that, like, you know, magic in upon itself um, isn't all that impressive. It's or it, all that interesting. It's, you know, it can be fireballs or it can be um, something or other. But it's what it represents in the narrative of the story that makes it interesting. So magic to um, to Tolkien, for example, is, is the... The, the basic will of the individual as manifested by godly powers. So literally there, it's divine intervention. But for, say, George R. R. Martin, it's more, much more of a science, question, question, no, no, science fiction question a la Asimov, where it might well be uh, technology hidden, you know? So I think that balance goes... It lays where the author has an understanding of an element of the real world that they, through the language of fantasy and magic, can give us a new perspective on. Uh, Dune, for example, being an extremely good uh, example of this, where the spice and all this, that's interesting enough, but it's its the uh, its the people dwelling on Arrakis and I'm able to uh, live in the desert and all the stuff that um, Frank Herbert had, had to know about desert dwelling and desert culture to make that understandable and 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 approachable that really made dune magical i think okay daniel matthews here love you and the spirit dude 
Oh. Hi, Evan. Hi, do Dan. Have, do you have any tips for getting work or finding clients to email when starting out? Um, I would, I mean, I can only really speak from my own experience. So I would say uh, the experience I've had is that trying to get work for a, um, a outsourcing studio is a good idea because not only will it yield you um, a ton of different kinds of work, so you learn a lot of different roles and different uh, problem solving positions in, in the industry, but also um, it gets you into contact with a bunch of other artists who um, sort of are trying to learn the same things as you are. So you can kind of build your own um, learning environment from that. Um, I think um, like Fantasy Flight uh, and a bunch of these sort of smaller card studios are a fine place to start. Uh, it won't yield you a lot of money, but it will give you some pay while you're using that cleverly and building your portfolio because they will, they, they're usually pretty light on, on their NDAs, so they'll let you use your stuff for, uh, for portfolio use after release, which is good. Um, so I've been pretty lucky lately that I haven't had to look for, for work. Like it's kind of come to me, but, um, I think sending your stuff out um, to a host of different clients is a good idea. And rather than specifically going like, please hire me, give me money. You can just, you can just tell them that, you know, you are out looking for work and if they should, if they should know of anything or if something should sort of come over their desk, then you would appreciate, you know, them reaching out. Um, because people are looking for cooperators and, and, and sort of friendly <laughs> friendly faces, as it were. Uh, and everyone's kind of, I don't know, it's, it, it's, it's a, bit of, a bit of a fidgety industry, this. So being sort of a voice of, of uh, uncomplicated um, reason is, is often a good idea. But I think, yeah, uh, trying to go to workshops, for example, getting to face to face with people who might have hiring power is a great idea um, and having some sort of an online presence to show to I think is good so that you know um, a bunch of the jobs that I've gotten is simply that my work has been in the right place at the right time um, so you know someone said like oh we need a character artist and then someone has like recently seen something that I posted and they'd be like oh maybe this guy and then they'd be like write him an email and then I get the email saying like hey someone in our you know production group thought you might be a good fit and then like yay works so yeah um i don't want to be uh you know someone who says that you have to partake in the rat race but um it's a good idea to you know do it on your own terms try and try and have stuff coming out every now and again so that people can be excited to see what you got going on do you use mixer brush more than standard brush um i don't i mean mixer brush being specific to uh, Photoshop. I don't really use it at all anymore. Uh, well, not at all. I sometimes use Photoshop, but I don't use Photoshop very much anymore. So, not really. Um, I do love Mixer Brush. Though. I do really miss it. Um, but uh, for the sort of similar effect, I use Smudge Brush and Normal Brush a lot. Mm. <laughs> hey, Evan. <laughs> Daniel again. Hey, Evan, Ooh. can you please sing us your favorite seal song, Kiss from a Rose, maybe? Yeah, what? I don't know. F fav fav favorite seal song? <laughs> Who has a favorite seal song? <laughs> I don't know. Um, do, 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 kiss of a rose, do, do. No, isn't don't that, do it. Isn't, isn't that Guns N' Roses? No, no, that's seal. That's from, from Batman. Oh, really? <laughs> my power, my pleasure. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That was Jack Black, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is Evan using a tribute? A, what did you say? <laughs> this is just a tribute. Is is Evan using a reference for this image, or is it all in his head? It's all in his head. <laughs> We've never met before, have we, sir? <laughs> It's all in his head. 
Um, do you use the paper you... foil on your iPad, or do you draw on the normal surface? Oh, uh, I do. So I can't remember what it's called now. This I have a little sort of a screen protector thingy, Um and it was called something like Digital Shield or Digi Shield or something. I have to find the packaging to one? remember. It's not very. It's it's got a little bit of texture, so mm -hmm. that it has. Yeah. Okay. So I guess that's what they meant by yeah. paper, or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's it's. Um, I think it's kind of necessary. Um, not to not to throw shade on iPads or nothing, but the they have like an oily sort of texture on them, um, and so it's nice to not deal with that. Evan, are you going to drop by on THU this year? Uh, I'm afraid not. Uh, on. It's been. <laughs> I'm. Uh... I, uh, yeah, I think self-indulgently. I'm, uh, I'm just, I'm waiting for, uh, for, for, uh, for the, for Andre to, to, to come begging me to, to, to come over. I think that's the only <laughs> way I'll make it to THU. Because that's what he's doing, right? He's going to people and beg them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, uh, but I'd love to. I, I, I do want to come back to THU. It's fun. Uh, it's just, it's been busy. Um, so. Uh, probably not this year, but maybe next year. Another question. Hi, Evan. If you had to start learning art again, what would your regimen be? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, mm. um, let's let's uh, let's pretend that I'm, what, 15 again? Uh, because, I mean, there's two scenarios there, then. Like, if I had to do it now, if I, if I, if I pulled a Claire Wendling and kind of just, you know, had an illness and kind of had to relearn everything... Um, I think I would um, I would probably start with Loomis. Uh, I like his approach, and I kind of know how to mitigate the stiffness that comes out of that. Um, so I probably would um, I would start with Loomis, and then I would um, I would definitely study uh, color theory more. I would try and get like an active and and. A nuanced understanding of that much earlier because it's taken me a long time and I still struggle a lot with understanding and appreciating color. It's still like I'm I'm better at it and I'm less sort of freaked out by it now. But it's still it took me so long and it was such a struggle for me to to get into colors that uh, I feel very handicapped with them now. Um, so I would definitely force myself to put more time and understanding into into color and get a better feel for that. Um, I don't know if I had them. If I had the memory of where I am now, I mean, this is this is <laughs> a theoretical situation, but I probably would um, have gone into and studied more like Japanese and Chinese draftsmen, um, just because there's a lot to be learned there that I feel are like parts of my weaknesses now. So yeah, like l little altered focuses, but I'm I'm pretty happy with how my stuff is. Uh... Hey, Mike is here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty happy with how things have sort of turned out, so I would not change much, I don't think. <laughs> Might be worth turning off the follower alert sound. Yeah, at some point. I, I just I just thought the same. I put it... Um, yeah, I think I will have to <laughs> tweak this a bit, because there... I mean, right now, in the beginning, there probably will be... A lot more followers than later but for now yeah i will change something i already uh, made it a bit lower from the sound um da -da -da -da. follow alert is really annoying yes i get it sorry what's an outsourcing studio <laughs> yeah oh hey don't laugh at that man that's that's perfectly reasonable um so an outsourcing studio is a studio that takes on out of house work for games and movie studios and stuff like that. So it's it's a it's a fully committed art studio, um, which means that working there you would probably be skipped from project to project a lot, which means you have a larger turnover of things and you probably would be working on shorter, more intense projects than working uh, in house. So it's a good place to go to learn. Um, you know. Um, yeah, that, that, the short summation of, <laughs> of exactly what that is. For the record, I was laughing about our Rothar saying Porch Monkey. Oh, I don't, oy, oy, oy. I don't know what Porch Monkey is. You don't? Oh, you, not, you, need to, you need to watch Clerks. 
Oh, Obi -Wan. oh wait, there was the discussion about it with uh, at Clerks 2, right? Yeah. With the grandma of the... Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? My um, grandma was not a racist, but she did refer to a broken bottle as a... Yeah, let's not say that okay. online. Okay, okay. Holy shit. Um... Raja is asking, what program do you use? This is uh, Procreate by Savage Software. It's for uh, the iPad Pro. And it's great. Will you guys be at Playgrounds Berlin this year? Evan doesn't know yet, but maybe he, they will. <laughs> oh, damn! You guys yes. can preview to all kinds of things. Yeah, things are in motion. We will see. I will nice. be there. I will be there for sure. Um, I'm involved with Firestarter. We are doing some sponsoring, hosting, and job market things. But uh, yeah, probably Evan will be there too. Movie. Do you use an iPad Pro or the 2018 iPad? And would you recommend it as a replacement for a Cintiq 13 inch, 16 inch, for instance? Uh, I mean, 13, 16 inch, that's pretty small. I don't exactly know uh, the size of that, but yes, I think, I mean, I, I use my iPad Pro for most of my work now and it works really well. So I would say it's a perfectly good replacement. Um, and it's really handy to be able to take your work with you. It does face some challenges, especially with clients who have like overly specific work modes. Um, but short of that, it's pretty pretty awesome. And most clients have been willing to sort of adapt to workarounds. So yeah, no, I'd, I'd say it's 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 a pretty amazing piece of piece of tech. I changed my micro's phone settings. Maybe you can hear me louder now. If you can, then just let me know. Maybe that helped. Um, perfect. Okay, good. Um, wait a second. Um, where were we? Ah, yeah. What are you reading these days? Oh, I'm reading the uh, <clears throat> four book series uh, by Gene Wolfe called... Severian of the Guild, which is a really, really insane book, or really insane four books. Um, it's to try and sort of pitch it. It's it's a um, classic hero's tale with the most iconic anti-hero of all of science fiction slash fantasy. It's one of those things where you it's hard, it's hard to tell whether it's either or. It's like a dying Earth novel, but it's also steeped in all of this sort of Christian mythology and um, Severian, the main character, who you're supposed to empathize with is like a terrible, terrible person. So it sets you up as the reader with a, a really weird dichotomy where you're not quite sure if you should be supporting this guy, but you automatically kind of feel for him when bad things happen and you feel in his corner when like, when, when shit goes down. Uh, but then, you know, he's a torturer <laughs> and um, yeah, pretty all-around terrible person so it's it's a complex book to read you learn some things about yourself reading that book mm, another question is why don't you use photoshop why use ipad instead well i mean um a bunch of re little reason i think uh procreate is a better drawing program than photoshop is um so even though there are certain drawbacks. <clears throat> I think just the smoothness of, of the pencil tools and the the ease with which you can get into drawings and kind of uh, all of that is really helpful. I'm not, I, I do love Photoshop, but it has a lot of redundancies that I have no interest in. Uh, and so it's an overly complex piece of software for something that uh, Procreate makes simple and uncomplicated. So I do love that about Procreate, uh, and it does mean that I don't get so easily pulled out of my workflow for like technical reasons. So it's that's part of it, um, and also just I really like working on the iPad. It's really nice to have all these like gesture controls. Um, there's there's something wonderful about having <laughs> that um, Control Alt Delete thing as just like a simple gesture. Um, though it does translate horribly when you go back to sketchbooks and you start tapping the pages, but 
uh, yeah, like I think the, just the simplicity of, and ease of use uh, are like very key factors for me. On the same level, the question is if you're getting neck cramps. Um, not really. Um, I usually take breaks. Well, you guys can't see the underdrawing on the stream now. That's that's terrible. Let's see if you can pick it up a little. There it is. Um, no, not really. Uh, I do stretch every day and um, you know try and um, try and keep my uh, my body tense while I'm drawing so that I'm not slouching too much. But um, it is a well-known problem, so I, I try to take breaks every sort of two hours while drawing, and I do uh, try and sort of get stresses out of my neck by the end of the day before sort of turning in. But I haven't had, like, that. that's worked pretty well for me. I haven't really had any adverse effects from doing a bunch of drawing units, at least not yet. The question is, do you have any cool exercises for coming up with the ideas for characters? Thanks. Uh, so, I think one's ability to do that is very much based on one's um, how much... I mean, I would say read. Like, read all that you can. It doesn't have to be fantasy. Like, good characters are everywhere. Uh, I think especially, like, autobiographies or biographies in general are great because they, they have a tendency to... to enable you as a reader to sort of impose archetypes on a particular person and then see how their personality and backstory would be paths to complicate that archetype and you know make it into like a complex character rather than a cliche so i think that's important i think um we get kind of as artists uh really sort of caught up in this idea that you know all of these complex ideas should be yours to do with as you please sort of naturally like we should be able to just come up with it um because we are artists and we are creative but it's not really how it works like you have to you have to appreciate the fact that you are just uh i mean at least in this respect you are a reflection of your experiences and we can't all go out and you know, know all the most important and interesting people in the world but we can read about them uh and if you read really well-written books, then, you know, sometimes you'll, or hopefully, they'll give you a solid understanding of things. Um, but also, you know, talking to interesting people is important, trying to get new perspectives, that sort of thing. Uh, I think all that really informs an interesting character. And then all of those other disciplines, like anatomy and color and gesture, all these things, are useful tools to serve, to illustrate and... and, and uh, inform people about the nature of the character that you're trying to show them you know but i think the really important bit is to be able to come up with interesting characters so then you have to be able to tell a story and in order to tell a story you need to know certain things so then read now the question is <clears throat> sorry um what do you mean by medicate the stiffness oh uh um didn't mean to say medicate, I said uh, mitigate, meaning to uh, minimize or to work against uh, the most severe outcome of mitigate. I think that's the definition? I'm not sure. But yeah, I try, I try to do exercises so as to minimize and mitigate the, the, the worst outcomes of like all this sort of stationary work. And then I, uh, I do go climbing, or at least I did for a long while, and now I'm taking a little break because I sprained my ankle something fierce last time I went. So it swelled up pretty good, and now it's just... For the next couple of weeks, it's going to be kind of achy until, uh, <laughs> until it's well and healed. So, you know, be careful when you go out working out people. But, um, yeah, I think that's important too, because otherwise you... I mean, short of depression and all that, um, it's good to get some energy out and go, go get yourself sweaty. Another question is, how many hours from pen touching paper of finished painting does one <laughs> of these characters paintings take? Uh, it's very individual. It depends, like depending on whether or not it's a personal piece or a uh, client piece. Uh, and whether or not I am well familiar with the source material and 
the context. So like when I was doing the Dune pieces, for example, they took an inordinately a long time because if I had to design everything, meaning that I had to like everything, every piece of the drawing became a very succinct and specific choice. Is, is it this or is it this? What does this hear, hear thing you know symbolize and what does it refer to? And does that read do, does it come through in the drawing? Um, so those became very sort of cerebral drawings. But uh, for something like this, I mean, you could probably get this to a fairly finished result in a couple of hours. How long are we going now? We've gone for about an hour. We have posing. Yeah, we have pretty much mostly we have most of the design done. Uh, now it's going to kind of sorting out what's going to be going on in the center here. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I'd say four hours maybe you could get something that's presentable, and then you could you know take it on and render it out and detail and and reassess for you know up to like at the longest these sometimes take 20 hours and sometimes they take 10 hours uh it very much depends on the character also on the style and like the amount of detail and all that so it's hard to give you like a specific number mm -hmm. would you start developing 3d skills of, uh, skills if you started from the beginning it seems like a must these days uh, I think if I started start now, I would start developing VR skills, and I kind of am trying to do that a little, if a little half-heartedly. Um, like I've been playing around with with some three D programs in VR, which I can I, I I think can be pretty fun uh, and can have great effects, but I don't know that it's necessary. I think it's a useful tool for a lot of things, but I think at the end. Uh, the art comes from the ideas and the the visual styling, so it doesn't really come from the tool. So 3D is a very useful tool, but I don't think it's a must. And I know a ton of artists who, who do not work 3D, so I don't think it's fair to call it a, like something really necessary, or at least not unanimously or ubiquitously so. But uh, no doubt is it handy to have, and no doubt does it help to have it on the CV. So, I mean, if I yeah, if I was to start now, I probably would. But then again, the application and the the modes of learning now are a lot different from ten years ago. So, yeah, hard to say. But I, I suppose I, I quite like a lot of the three D stuff I'm seeing these days. It's 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 getting good. Guess who is asking, Evan, do you drink fight milk to fight with the power of crow? Oh, fight milk! Um, right now I'm just doing, you know, pure spring water. Um, but, dude, if I, if I had some uh, some crow's eggs and, uh, and uh, some brew made by real, um, real bodyguards, then I would definitely drink it. Fight milk! Lenny Art is asking, in concept art, do you suggest using shape design or go with lines? I struggle using shape, but when I'm using a line, I notice that my shape lack of interest. Well, I mean, so the, that's that's a little bit like asking, you know, like if, if, if you're making food, do you use parsley or salt? Why not both? Um, like... Shape language is just a design sensitivity. It's just the reasoning behind certain design choices. Um, so it doesn't really stipulate correctly. It, it just says, you know, triangles are evil because of this piece of logic and circles are nice because of this piece of logic, whether it's because circles intuitively are less scary to us or less aggressive to us or whatever other sort of casuistic argument you want to present. Um, and I don't think that that's separated from drawing. You can still do that in drawing and um, and sort of present interesting shapes. I think it's just an awareness. So I try and do both. I try to get better at, at, um, at using uh, shapes actively and, and consciously. Um, I learned a lot about sort of the subtler use of, of shape language by watching uh, Mike Acevedo draw. Uh, shout out to my boy Mike, and just like he, his intermingling of, of abstract um, geomorphic shapes and 
and like lifelike drawing elements really sort of kicked my ass when I saw it for the first time. So I think, I, 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 yeah, I think it's both. If that's not too much of a <laughs> undercut of an answer. Um, yeah, the classic one. Evan, can you talk about your journey to Blizzard and why you changed your mind? Ooh, <laughs> so the journey to Blizzard was real simple. It was waking up the day before Christmas uh, a couple of years back to a, an email that just said, uh, hey, uh, we over Blizzard kind of like your work. You want to come over here and do some work? And I was like, uh, uh, someone's playing a real mean joke. Oh, that's funny. So I wrote him back and I was like, hey, uh, you know, if this is a joke, then that's real freaking mean. But, you know, if it's not, then yeah, you know, this would be cool. Because I I grew up with, with, you know, with the Warcraft games. I really loved Warcraft 3. Uh, it was was one of my introductions to you know like uh, a more approachable form of, of fantasy and it was one of the video games I really loved uh, so uh, you know like I, I, in my mind Blizzard was like one of the places to be uh, so uh, it turned out that this was one of the art directors at Blizzard and that it wasn't bullshit and uh, they were like yeah so um, that was actually an example of just right place right time because that they had been looking for someone to replace i believe alex constant when he had been there uh, or someone else who had uh, who had quit and um laurel had had my work up and so it had gotten suggested and everyone was like yeah that's fine he doesn't suck um and then you know they, they asked and i came over and it was bliss for the first couple of weeks uh, it was great um, and Blizzard is it, it, Blizzard is an awesome place to work if you like Blizzard things, um, and I did um, until I kind of realized I didn't because what they did was they they gave me all of the games, uh, and I know that sounds ungrateful, but then I got to play all of the games, and I realized that I didn't like any of them uh, other than um, Warcraft Three, and that was more nostalgia than anything. This is not entirely true. I do still I think Overwatch is a good game. I think it's a really good game. Um, but I was a big Team Fortress 2 fan. Uh, and so when I played Overwatch, I was like, e it's too much the same. It's not, yeah. Like it, it, it just, like it, it, it tasted too much like Team Fortress 2 for me to sort of get me excited. Um, and so like being there was, it, it was a bit of a sort of, it wasn't a letdown, but it was, it was a breaking of an illusion. It was, um, suddenly realizing that you know you got the dream job, but it wasn't the dream job anymore when you saw what it actually was, um, and so um, that combined with uh, me finding that Irvine, California, is my least favorite place on earth. It is so boring. So yeah, it took about six months, and then I was out. So Blizzard is a nice place. It really is. Uh, and I have nothing but praise for, for the fine people who work there. But god damn, they placed their headquarters in a... Ugh, Yonsville. So yeah, that, that that's the majority of it. Jay's asking um, a long question, which is... There has been a significant hiatus between my early years with art and now. I have become unwell and there are prominent voids as a result. Although I have continued to have ideas throughout these years and I have persisted in developing an intellectual property as a concept. I plan on contextualizing this further. My question is, how do you overcome regrets of time loss and trying to find the balance between work and life? How, in your opinion, does one then overcome such insecurities? Uh, I do not know if I'm the person to ask because, <laughs> you know, like every time I see someone who's younger than me, who's like kicking ass and taking names and freaking just being awesome, I'm like, eh, I should have started. Like I, I remember the years I spent just, you know, wasting perfectly good time that I could have been doing stuff on, you know, just stuff that I now like 
thinking, eesh, that's not important. I should be doing that. But then, you know, I turn around and I'm still doing that to a degree. I'm still doing stuff that might very well end up being a regret in the future. But I don't know that it's going to be. And I'm enjoying it immensely now. And it's giving me something. It's giving me, you know, pleasure and fun and a certain joie de vivre. And so, I don't know. I don't think any time is wasted. I think uh, time spent on regretting time wasted is time itself wasted. So get over it. Um, like, don't don't overthink it. If, if you're not dead yet, you still have time. So that's fine. Um, and if you're going to start calculating, you know, how much time is wasted on this and how much time is wasted on that, you'll just get miserable. It doesn't really give you anything uh, yeah. in form of useful information. So, yeah, forgive yourself and then move on and then do more, you know? If that doesn't sound too much like, yeah, get over your depression, yeah, baby. I, I don't mean that. Like, I, I, I understand that it can be hard to sort of get yourself out of that mind trap, but um, if it all helps, I am telling you, go forgive yourself and uh, really stick yourself into this thing that you're passionate about and see if that doesn't help. Do you miss Canada, Quebec City? Ooh, Quebec City. I do miss Quebec City. Um, I love Quebec. Quebec is fun. Quebec has some... Uh, Quebec, no doubt, in my mind, has the best cursing culture in at least North America, if not the world. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go to Quebec. Um, just, just, just do it. It's definitely worth it. And they have an excellent amount of uh, local microbreweries, and it's it's a fantastic place. It's It really is. Um Especially if you're into this industry, you might well end up working in Montreal, which is becoming sort of a, a second uh, capital of, of, uh, of the industry. So, um, yeah, nothing but love for, for Quebec. I love that place. Which is the uh, except, for, except for goddamn sugar shacks. I understand the obsession with maple syrup. I love maple syrup, but goddamn it, every goddamn sugar shack I went to had like a radio announcer dude who was like, now we're done with the pancakes. It was, this was all in... in uh, Quebecois French, so I didn't understand a word of it the first time, and it was really scary. But he had one of those like really annoying uh, radio announcer voices, and oh, good lord, nothing ruins a meal more. What is what is? I just wondered because you hit the the, the second capital of the industry. What's the first? Ah, uh, if well, I would have thought LA, LA, but maybe it's New York. I don't know. Is it still LA? I'm not sure. I suppose. It's the yeah. It's if there is it's, something like capital of the industry, I suppose. I I would have thought that that place seems to be the place with the highest uh, concentration in the per per capita concentration of 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 you know concept artists. I think, but <coughs> mm. hey, what do I know? I live in Norway, <laughs> which is great. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Interesting story. Evan. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, hello, man. Very cool to discover you other ways than Instagram live station posts. Yeah. I have used five. I have used five years drawing noses. Still struggling with it. <laughs> oh, who doesn't? Um, cake or death? Oh, <laughs> well. Well, can I have? Can I have cake? Is there any cake left? What do you think that is more important in an illustration portfolio? Fantasy, for example, or? I think the, the, the most important thing in an illustration portfolio, and I know this is gonna sound like condescendingly and douchey, but is illustration. Uh, I see so many people who bring me their por uh, illustration portfolios and what, like they have, you know, such beautiful things in there but they are not illustrations. They are essentially show off pieces to show like I can render hair, I can render this, I can render that. None of that matters if I don't know what the illustration is about. So you've, by focusing on your technical skills have avoided the thing that those things are supposed to serve. Um, so I think the most important thing is to really focus on having a message worth telling that's interesting uh, and really using all the tools of the trade to tell that story. 
otherwise you're just kind of left with you know a bunch of uh, colors on the page so there's that uh, and I think um, depending on what your portfolio is is intended for I think you can answer that question too so if you're trying to get jobs say specifically for fantasy then yes fantasy is a good idea but it's not necessarily that important as long as you can show that you have problem solving skills that would make you able to solve the problems that might come up in in a uh, fantasy illustration so if you have a bunch of sci-fi illustrations but they show a skill set that would make good fantasy illustrations then um then I think that would be worthwhile putting in the portfolio. My point being, like, people really re will react to the quality of your paintings. I don't necessarily think they will react much to the content. Um, but if you want to attract fantasy artists, uh, fa fantasy clients, then making stuff that shows that you care about fantasy is probably a good idea. El Velenard is saying, Hi, Evan. Nice to see that you stream too. How many years experience in art do you have? Ooh, uh, well, that is that is a phrasing, all right. Um, I, th I mean, in art, I have experience from the, er <laughs> the earliest experience that we have any proof of is a drawing from when I was six. So that would leave us 24 years. But I'm guessing what you mean is in the industry. So my first job I got when I was... 18 it was doing freelance uh characters for this tiny little texan game studio called anthropos games and i know that they still exist because they found me on twitter which was super nice uh but they made uh like a little uh, board game thing like a little D, D inspired thing and needed a bunch of characters and a bunch of uh sort of culture exploring sketches um and i did them for like 50 dollars a pop and that is, yeah, that's 11 years ago now. So I guess you could say 11 years if you didn't want to beat around the bush. <laughs> the boastful Baron is saying, uh, Spiridon, you need to make a workshop with Evan and Greece. The lack of concept art related stuff is unbearable here. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess in the end, I would just drag Evan to the place where my parents are, which is Konica in, in the middle of the mountains. I guess Evan would love it. But, oh, Evan, but everybody would have to yeah. leave fucking Athens to get somewhere else. <laughs> which means that it won't happen in, in the end because uh, eh. there's not a chance that I will stay in Athens a single day. <laughs> is it that bad? I hate it. <laughs> oh, man. It, this is my Irvine. Oh. Uh. Okay. <laughs> well, see, see that, that I will not accept for a very simple expedient, which is you could take, if, if there was such a thing as a geographic eraser, uh, then you could take that to Irvine and just take it away and no one would notice but i think <laughs> i think unesco for one would make a little note in their diary if athens was just erased off of the map yeah if you think unesco is actually interested in athens and not just the fucking necropolis then yes you're all right but everything around nah, these that's two not... or three sites is just <laughs> yeah i haven't I've, i haven't been for years so i can't really speak to it but i, I would love to go back to athens Maybe we can set something up. I'm Hell yeah. Never say never. Um, apparently, there is no cake left. Just informing you. <gasps> Damn it. So my choices are or death. <laughs> um, and uh, we have two people asking uh, if you can define illustration. Uh, well, illustration, it's in the name. You are illustrating something, right? If it's concept art, then you are illustrating an idea. If it's an illustration, as in a book illustration, then you're illustrating an aspect of the book. Uh, if it's, um, like you could say narrative illustration is to illustrate an element of story. But uh, the point is that, uh, the point, point of, of the, the portfolio thing, which I guess is what they're referring to, is that illustration is not, the, like the craft is drawing and painting. And that's not what you're showing off in illustration portfolio. In the illustration portfolio, you're trying to show off the artistic aspect, which is to use those tools, those crafts, to tell a story. That's where it becomes art. That's where, where illustration becomes illustration. Mm -hmm. 
how do you earn i think it means it means learn how do you learn to make your character so plastic sculptural oh i'm not sure what that means plastic sculptural but i'm guessing that they have like a sense of three-dimensionality uh we should probably wait on a response because i don't want to go railing off on the wrong question but if that is correct then um yeah then I'll, i can expand on that we will see hmm? um then we have there was another one obviously i'm right with uh, with athens i'm getting a lot of <laughs> <laughs> thumbs up um El Velenard is asking, I've been drawing for years now, but I still can't get on a good level with my art. Do you have any essential tips for drawing and painting? You know, tips you would give your own younger you. Okay, what have you been drawing for years? That's very important, because I did that too. I drew you know, the same things over and over and over, and used the things that I felt like I knew how to do. Uh, and then, essentially, when I came to Volta, I... I got, had this sort of eureka moment, or not a eureka moment, because I didn't understand. Um, I was made to understand by my art director that if I kept drawing just the same things that I knew how to draw, then I wasn't learning anything. Uh, and then I started drawing other things, and I just started. He started to sort of showing me, you know, how to treat this piece and this thing, and how um, by doing this and this you could gain these and these um, results and this was because of that and that essentially showing me again the art or, or craft as um, non-mystical it's just down to an understanding of the mechanisms of things um, then I started sort of actively drawing things that I didn't necessarily know how to draw and started learning a lot more so I think the problem we all, most of us run into is that we begin to draw for pleasure, which is good. We should all draw for pleasure. Uh, I'm doing so right now, having fun. But um, in so doing, we tend to tie up the quality and reception of a drawing with our own ego. And there we can run into some fugly problems because um, then it becomes more important for us to draw something pretty than to draw something well. And that is a mistake. So by focusing on learning and focusing on um, making sure that what you're putting on paper is get getting you new information and that you're judging it not by the prettiness of the drawing but by the, <clears throat> by the academic outcome, as well as, as a service to the to the beauty of what you're making, then you be learning. But I might have misunderstood the entire question, so let's see if that's. I don't know. Um, the previous Does question about the sculpture style it was indeed the three D thing, like you guessed right. All right, so that whole sort of plasticine um, thing is down to a technique that I kind of again to shout out Mike Azevedo. Uh, to a degree, kind of stole from him, which is this whole focus on uh, breaking down the complexity of painting into simple um, elements that you can tackle individually. So I'll break down different light sources into different layers um, and really try and make things simple enough so that I can understand them. And if I can, then I can use them to to some effect or other. So it's about keeping control of your light sources, about your textures and the the thing, the tools that you're using to create your drawing. Um, so hopefully you'll see some of that in the stream. But essentially, there's a combination of that and being very aware of the three-dimensionality of what you're drawing so that the volumes that you have to create from the lines that you put down make sense three-dimensionally. I I have to draw with, with a, an eye to what it will look like in 3D so that um, there's like <clears throat> there's an unspoken rule that you can get away with much more in a drawing than in a painting and so, so through like a lot of trial and error you can kind of get comfortable with uh, with an understanding of, of, of what you draw 
correctly in 3D and what you're screwing up. And then when you know what you're screwing up, you can go back and you can um, you can fix that. But so this is why I really like um, learning the Loomis method because it forces you to have a three dimensionality or three dimensional understanding of what you're drawing. Um, and in so doing, it solves a lot of these problems for you and sets up things that are easier to paint. Jonas here. Hey! Um, Hurricane Daddy. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. Uh, that's a good one. Um, how much would you say having a portfolio centered around your own IP matters to a potential client compared to separate standalone pieces? Uh, I mean, again, these just tell the clients different things. Um, so if I if I work uh, like an entire IP for a bunch of portfolio pieces, uh, it's important that then what this shows the client is that I can do cohesive design and I can sort of create and use a design language um, as a way of creating uh, both group designs and um, interesting individual designs that work together. So, um, and then if you if you do a bunch of individual pieces, then that shows them that you have a wide, wider set of interests and that you can tackle different source materials, but it still needs to be obvious in this portfolio that <clears throat> that you understand um, you know, how the fundamentals of design can be carried over from one um, set of source material to, to another. Um, this is a good one, and I'm going to answer a call for a second, so I'm going to give you this one. Uh, cool. For a concept artist portfolio, what is the most important to have in it? Ooh. Well, I would say I would say concept art. Um, so a really important thing to have in a concept art portfolio is uh, a clear definition of the initial concept, and then some sort of uh, explanation for the way you went about solving the visual problems presented by that concept. So if if you want to show off a bunch of like concept pieces, it should be obvious what problems you were trying to solve, right? So if you say, for example, that you made a group of mercenaries, all right, but then you have to set, set up the particular limitations that the context of those mercenaries <clears throat> presented and what opportunities were presented by that context so that uh, it's obvious, you know, how... Not not just what the result was, but what the the path to those results were. So if those mercenaries, for example, are like fantasy mercenaries, then um, then you should have an idea of you know what the technical limitations of that fantasy world is, uh, and what like the culture that surrounds them look like. Um, and these are all reflections of how deep you know the particular world that you're operating in is. Um, but it should be sort of a general rule that your understanding and your uh, <clears throat> your thinking about these things um, as the designer should go as deep, if not deeper, than than your audience. So yeah, the more thought and the more care you can put into it, the the better. But I think the the important thing is to show that you understand how to break down an issue, um, gain understanding, and then present interesting visual solutions to conceptual problems <laughs> the lovely tones of spitted on discussing in background yeah all right so it's just me and you guys for a little while oh here comes a long question if one were capable of producing work through and with varied media types drawing sculpting painting and whether through traditional or digital although had a preference toward one in particular i think blah 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 okay with confidence, although there's much greater interest in the drawing itself, how does one then perhaps overcome the choice paralysis between acquired available skill sets and producing work through the medium one has? Um, that is an excellent question and one that I'm 
uniquely poorly positioned to answer since I have kind of chosen my limitations and did so kind of early on. But I would say... Um, uh, find what makes you happier in that case. If you have all these um, points of access, then find whichever makes you happier. Focus on that. Um, <clears throat> because if, if, if all of this stuff is available to you uh, and you kind of just, you know, you're having an embarrassment of riches, um, you're going to have time to explore it all in the end. So you just have to make a choice of where to start. And I usually suggest starting with the one that makes you happiest, just because that makes it easier to, <clears throat> to uh, keep up your enthusiasm and get, you know, deeper learning out of that. And then you can always turn back and try some other things, you know? Were we still at the concept artist thing? I just returned. No, I took in, I took the the question that's most recent in the chat. Okay. Um, then another one would be, would you ever consider reviewing or doing paint overs or work sent into you maybe for Patreon stream and or payment? Yes, I can answer that. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we, we talked about that. Um, so yeah, that's uh, definitely coming. So yeah, that's, get, that's, your, that's get your portfolios ready. Let's do some reviews. This is about uh, a goal that that, uh, that I set in his Patreon, which is about uh, getting a certain amount of followers, which would mean that there can be uh, he can take time off uh, work to mm -hmm. um, so we, we would moderate uh, a discord server and uh, we would offer at a later point also mm -hmm. mentorship. Right. I mean, you said. Mentorship. Yeah. So yeah, so join join the Patreon, yeah. join the revolution. The more join, the more um, Evan can do. It's simple as that. Yay! Um, da -ba -da -ba -da. <clears throat> okay, for a person that does cartoon style drawings, I just recognize that this is not the thing that they want to do in his professional career, and he wants mm -hmm. to focus more in Blizzard stuff, illustration, concert art what this person should do to make this transition. All right. So Blizzard, I would say, is still pretty cartoony. But if you're talking about sort of Blizzard cinematics, then that's a different kettle of fish. Um, I think if you don't want to do cartoony stuff, you should ask yourself why you were doing cartoony stuff in the first place. And if that's because that's the thing that you knew how to do, then, um, yeah, that's, the, the, that's, that's a good starting point. So then I think... Um, I think... The problem with saying, I don't want to do this, I want to do that, is that that's just another goal. Like, you started out wanting to do cartoony stuff for some reason, and it turned out that that was an insufficient reason. So what I would suggest is start by studying. Start by creating your own visual interpretations of the world, which is essentially what studies are. And then find your own style through that. And then, you know, that is the kind of mark making and the kind of... Um, visual representation that makes you happy so once you have that then go and find clients that you know that to to whom you could apply this or to whose works and to whose uh, worlds and ips you could apply this and that they would like i think that's a better way of going about it because then um rather than aiming for a particular style from a particular studio you are um kind of adding something to the conversation and not just making yourself uh, a copy of an already established style. Next question. Are you controlling your line thickness with pressure alone? I really struggle to finish to do finished art uh, line work in Photoshop. Also, did you study from Heinrich Klein and T.S. Sullivan? Uh, I do use pressure sensitivity sometimes and sometimes not, depending on how I feel. Um, sometimes I'll use the Narinder pencil, for example, a lot, um, and then I'll focus less on that. Um, that is a struggle, though. So you have to you have to just practice it. And again, this is a this is a reflection of having done a lot of um, studies with a brush pen, and so I found like a lot of joy in in playing around with line uh, dynamics. So try and bring some of that into digital to sort of free up some of the stuff that gets a little boring, like the really contrite line art I do sometimes. Um, it's it's just it's a it's a way of keeping it interesting and keeping it fun for myself. 
Um, I don't. Is Heinrich, whoever the hell you said, <laughs> is that the guy who? Yeah, Clay, that's the guy who did all those like cartoony elephants and stuff. But like, in, he's incredible at doing them. I think. If so, then yes, I love that guy. I just never remember his name. Okay, another long one. Question. If one were capable of producing work through and with varied media... Oh, that's, uh, that's the one I answered. Oh, right. Okay. Um, what artist do you look up to? Who just blows you away? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> What's your favorite color? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many. Um, it's blue. And all. Um, so so consecutive, the, 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 there are certain artists that I admire purely and whose work I don't want to emulate but who I just I find them so fascinating and then there's the ones that I, I curse the very daylight that lights them because god damn it it just ruins my day how good some people are um so for example um I love Max Grecki Max Grecki is amazing and I love his work and I don't want to draw like him but I do love the fact that he draws the way he does um and then there are you know artists like Paul Dayton, who just like, if I could do what Dayton does, I, I, he's the, he's one of those artists where like, I'm still convinced, even though I know it's bullshit, that if I could just draw like that, I would be happy. I would find true happiness. And of course, I probably wouldn't, but uh, there's probably like, you know, million things that he's super insecure about. But um, the way he draws is like the, the, oh, the way he kind of paints and draws at the same time is very, very much, um, at sort of the height of my uh, my idea of artistic excellence. Um, so, I think, that, yeah, like Kim Jung Gi, Claire Wendling, these are people who who definitely are at a level, a technical level, that I would love to approach. Um, but I think I think the artist that still just like fucks me up the most, uh, just because he he kills me every time is <laughs> and i know it's gonna be sound sappy but it's my best friend it's a uh, jesper hatcher um who is a tattoo artist who like when i go to hang out at the studio and i see the way he works and i see like the care and the the depth of thought he puts into the tattoos that he you know permanently puts on people's freaking bodies by stabbing them continuously with a needle um <laughs> It blows me away. Like it kicks my ass because it makes like whatever I do, I feel like it's not you know it's not even nearly uh, as important. Um, but it was the same. You know, like I, I think I have I get that from from working in close proximity to people. So I have the same for from my wife when I watch her draw and she never believes me and I'm sure she's gonna laugh and like punch me on the shoulder later. But god damn, like just the way like the way she treats lines and 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 just her way of seeing pretty little things that she can put into a drawing that's amazing to me um and 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 mike azevedo like the way he designs i want to I, I want that i don't have that but i want that you know so there's oh there's a ton uh and then um uh blah, 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 daniel clark south african artist He's been doing a series of just studies of of uh, street fashion, and that too, like just the fact that he sees this stuff and 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 the way he treats it, ugh, makes me wax lyrical with with uh, enthusiasm for what could be. So yeah, that's a, that's a spontaneous little list. It's not exhaustive. There's a bunch of others, but um, yeah off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> hey, sorry for so many weird questions, but I'm curious. Do you think talent is needed to become a great artist? No! <laughs> Do you think anybody can become great uh, in art when they just work hard and passionate enough? Well, okay, so let's just... De like, I'm a big fan of demystification. It, let's demystify it. Talent is the grand total of the things people know before we started checking. That's talent. That's what it is. Um, so I don't think talent matters for much. It might matter for sort of initial enthusiasm and or initial mastery. But I think the closest thing you get to talent is people's natural ability to learn. 
Uh, and so anyone can learn. Sometimes certain things will be harder for some people, but this is there's no magic to this. There's no special powers. If you if you apply yourself to the understanding of the craft of you know depicting three dimensions on two dimensions, which is essentially what drawing is and painting, then then you can do that. It's not it's not impossible. It's not even that hard. I mean, it's just, you know, like you have to do it a lot. You have to really apply yourself, not just to the, the, the quest for like recognizably strong drawing results, but a really in-depth understanding of not just the mechanics of drawing and painting, but the mechanics of the three dimension, three dimensional object you are trying to depict. Um, or, you know, the nature of, the design language you're trying to develop or whatever you're trying to do with depiction. Uh, so no, I, I have no patience for, for uh, talent. Um, I would much rather have someone who, who uh, works consistently and works hard and is willing to, you know, learn. That's, that's important. What's the symbiosis that's happening between you two? Is she meaning me and you, or is she meaning you and your wife? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Because if it's between me and my wife, then uh, I think I prefer to stay between me and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> What's this sweet thing you do? I want a mama bird and a daddy bird love each other very much. Between us, I think if it was us, she, he's, he's a very good artist. He doesn't have time to do marketing and stuff. So I'm l taking the chance <laughs> to learn from him. So. doesn't have time. I don't know anything. Yeah. I know nothing so other he's, than he's, drawing. So Spiridon has saved me from a life of impoverished servitude. He's, he's fucking useless. So <laughs> exactly there, there you have the truth people. It's, I think it's really a kind of symbiosis while we were at it, because in the end I, I'm getting the chance to um, gather a lot of knowledge what I would do if I had his skill and at the same time that enables him to keep working so yeah it is I think yeah I think that's about it yeah I'm um, giving you a long question again and then I have, I have some trouble with uh, with a printer for a fire starter and I have to call them again uh, mm -hmm. I'll give you another question here which is uh, again from Jay hello oh by the way you might want to turn up your mic when you do that because we can hear you walking around in the background oh really I turned it off yeah. <laughs> all right uh, hello Evan again brilliant work my question is if one finds the time towards developing an intellectual property or concept and would like to further this into uh, through publication such as in a book format what would be your advice in doing so? A coherence, consistency, presumably, is important with organizing a book. Although, could you speak towards the logistics of this? <laughs> Thank you very much for taking Ooh. the time and for the generosity. Again, really brilliant and beautiful work also. Yeah, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I, mean, I mean, it's a bit of a symbiosis with that previous answer. Uh, I don't know anything about that. Well, I do know some things, but not much. I think my, I mean, if, if my honest answer was like, get yourself a spirit on, because that goddamn it, like that help. But, um, so to give a little bit more of an applicable answer, um, I have the call. Okay. Do it. Um, I think the important thing is to, to, to build, uh, the necessary audience for something like that. If you, for example, if you want to go into crowdfunding, uh, like we did with Kickstarter, yeah, we can still hear you. Well, at least I can. I don't know if the, if the others can. Um, so, like crowdfunding is very much dependent on um, having a group of people already interested, I think, before launching, and then leveraging that into further exposure so that you can get a sufficient amount of people interested uh, in the project. Ooh, I'm not saying that this underarm here is way long, so we're gonna fix that before I go on. But anyway, um, the logistics was never really my thing because that was what Spiridon came in for. Like, if, if it had been up to me, I would have probably just turned the books into like, a, or just had turned all the the dailies from 2016 into like a PDF and just given it out for free. Um, and then I aired that thought to Spiridon. He was like, are you crazy? Gotta make a book! Gotta make a book! So then we made a book. Um... And back again. 
so like the whole thing of you know, finding printers and, and trying to put the books together, like I'm not the person to do any of that. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if you have something to supplement there, Spiro, but... Um, I'm not sure what you just, like I, I was just on the phone, so I'm not sure what, what you answered. Um, oh, I was just trying to elaborate on like essentially get yourself a spirit on, but yeah, um, reading the question, I would say that's um, it's, it's it's quite a thing to to wrap in a, a whole job in two or three sentences. So uh, <laughs> you're always free to ask me personally on Facebook. You can find me there, and we can have a chat. That'd probably be better. Um. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba. Portfolio reviews will be available in a new tier on Patreon. Yes, that's the idea. A question for the backwater bastards. Do you hey. do you guys struggle with RPing via cameras? Rolled 20 opened my group and I uh, a way to play frequently, but it doesn't compare it with all of us being at the same table. Um, yeah. uh, no, I, I understand the question. Okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, not really. We... I mean, the, the amount of role playing we do is kind of scandalously small to begin with. We we all have pretty you know, exuberant and, and and predictive characters that we play out. I think I think one of the things we're trying to get better at is actually RPing. But um, no, I mean, we we, we put aside the, aside the time and RPing is kind of trying to just get into the head of the character that you're playing and uh, you know making choices that. If not for the betterment of you know the outcome of the game, it's for the betterment of the story. So I think we're all kind of sitting and thinking about um, continuously thinking about like what's best for the story, what's, what what will be funny, um, and uh, you know sometimes we get a little formulaic, like maybe we'll, maybe once too often Blaznak has simply gone and just uh, you know stormed into the middle of a battle, flinging his hammer around and shouting curses. Um, so, um, the arping itself, or the getting into that and sort of staying in character, is not very hard because none of us are that interested in whether or not we survive. Um, we're interested in, in having a good time. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's pretty easy. That and like you know, we we all kind of have an easy time hanging out with each other. Um, and I guess it's it helped that we did start doing it digitally, so the like that comparison. But I understand what you mean because I've I've played it. I played D&D &D, uh, sort of in a room, and it's always more of an ambiance. Sort of, it's, yeah, it's more of a mood. But yeah, I think you can do that. Um, doing it online too. It's just you have to you have to just keep at it. I think Evan could make a fine voice actor. You don't want that. <laughs> oh, Edwin, I wouldn't mind that. That'd be cool. <laughs> I'd love to know what he's acting. Um, anybody, if anybody has any... I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd love to be, like, you know, halfling number three from the left. Oh, hey, for no to do! Shit. That'd be awesome. <laughs> A question. Evan, I see that you keep lines in your work, and I love to keep them, but uh, too, but in terms of industry, keeping the lines is a good thing, or we shouldn't... should not care about it. Uh, depends on what your lines are for, right? Like if 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 they if they interfere in the final piece, then get rid of them. Uh, and if they are helping the final piece, then keep them. Um, I think, especially because of you know the rise of photo slapping and all that stuff, we kind of all gravitate towards a final product that represents something, if not photorealistic, then at least sort of thoroughly painted out. Uh, and I think a lot of techniques for like cheating the eye into thinking that they're looking at something more rendered than they actually are is kind of lost. So I think as long as you can present something that you know describes a fully three-dimensional reality, I don't think most clients give a shit. Uh, that's been in my experience anyway. They like they'll they'll ask for a little bit of rendering here and there if if, if they need it, but essentially rendering is there so as to force the art not, not to force to encourage the artist to create things that correspond with a three-dimensional nature rather than two-dimensional uh, or to create something that works in three dimensions uh, so as long as you draw in a way that 
illustrates something working in three dimensions, usually they let you get away with it. <laughs> Bjorn. Um Question, did you like being a judge on the uh, Unreal Bjornament team? <laughs> Will you join next year? <laughs> Dude, if you'll have me, I'd love to. That was that was okay. I love it. Um, so, uh, absolutely. If you'll have me back next year, I would love to be a judge again. Um, make a drawing of Matt Mercer and go to Critical Role as a guest. Okay. Um... I got. I got to admit, I don't know who. I. I know. I should. I know as someone who does backward bastard, I should have listened to uh, this other one by now. But I'm. I haven't. So I feel. <laughs> I feel bad about that. You gotta get a guest spot on Critical Role. Okay. Still want whatever Evan is smoking. Um. Ooh. <laughs> How very he's, racing. He's high on life. Yeah. Um, you know, you know me. I'm a good boy. Blasnak in the same room with not would be amazing. I don't know who not <laughs> is. Okay. Um. I find it pretty hard to get rid of my bad habits on while drawing. I know the solution might be studying more, but whenever I struggle with that, I find myself not enjoying it. Then my solution to that, um, I drawing just for fun, uh, but I find myself not enjoying it because <laughs> I'm not good enough to depict what I want to. How did you find balance in this? Right. So the, I found balance in that, but by essentially figuring out how to love studying. Um, so when you say you don't enjoy studying, I'm going to assume that you pull up a piece of reference and then just start copying it. Um, because otherwise, I don't understand what there isn't to enjoy. You see, like when you study specifically, like if, if, if you're trying to draw something specific and you don't know how to draw it to a sufficient level where you enjoy the drawing, then you have to look at that drawing and think not just, oh, it's not a good drawing. Ooh. You have to look at it and say, what about this drawing is it that is not working? What do I need to change for it to work? Well, not just I have to get better at this and this, but I have to, like this and this, like anatomy, for example, or composition or posing or gesture is important for this piece and it's what's not working. And so then you should go and specifically find reference for uh, the betterment of those disciplines. And with an eye towards resuming that piece, you should uh, study with, an, uh, with, with, with uh, like specifically towards understanding whatever you are missing from the piece. And then, you know, once you have that, go and apply it and see if that doesn't help. And if it doesn't, then you go back and you reanalyze. But yeah, like drawing for pleasure is difficult because we tend to do it uh, we, t we tend to gravitate towards drawing things that we already know how to draw rather than focusing on uh, figuring out how to draw the things that we want to draw. So if you can make studying it for yourself a discipline of gaining that knowledge, I think you'll find that studying gets a lot more fun. Mm. Arsonist Bomber, what's up? I was going to ask you if you do emotes. I know you are focused right now, and I don't know if this is the right time to ask you. Emotes? What are emotes? Okay. Well, I mean, I mean if I make emotes, I haven't. Uh... I don't know what this is. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, never say never, but <laughs> that, that doesn't really sound like something. I would do. Let me check. Um, have you ever gotten clients who ask you um, for the more sketchy style that you use uh, for your daily sketches instead of a fully rendered style 
that is more prevalent in the industry? Yes, a bunch. Uh, a lot of what I do is pre-production. Uh, and in pre-production, there's usually a lot of call for like quicker exploratory sketches. So even in my sort of lumbering slow style, uh, that does mean, you know, trying to indicate detail rather than expressing detail. So yeah, I, I do a bunch of that. It's very useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cafeino man. Hi, Evan. Hi, Spiridon. Oh, so, uh, so yeah. how, how is the name even spelled in, in French? I know it in, in Xavier. Xavier? What do you say? Uh, question. Xavier! <laughs> question. Are you sometimes tired of rendering or precise things with design elements and all? Because many times when I draw, I have a concept. I draw the rough stuff and sometimes it's okay. But I let the thing on the side because I want, cre want to create more stuff. Um, not just render shits. So... How do you manage to finish all the rough things? Do you do one drawing till the end each time, or do you have tons of concepts that we're never used to? Um, I have, a, I mean, so I have a ton of unfinished sketches, but that's unfinished because sometimes I want to sit down and do like an explosion of, of, of ideas. Like I have a ton of ideas and I just want to get them out. So then I'll do a bunch of rough sketches in different files and then I'll have them so that you know I'll 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 denote whatever it is that I'm trying to do with that piece and then you know leave it if I then come back and find that I'm inspired to do it later then I'll pick it up but if not you know then screw it I'm not very finicky about that like I'll 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 throw away a sketch if if I'm not interested anymore but I also try not to be um, too glib about that like I try to I try to have an idea before I sit down to work so that I'm not just like you know, trying something and throwing it away and throwing it again because that I feel is more uh, relying on chance than actual designing. So, a little bit of both. Our mm -hmm, mm -hmm. comment says, speaking of study, you should not just learn how to draw something, but also why. Okay. Mm -hmm. Miguel Iglesias is here. Hello. Oh. Um, uh, the question is if you design emotes. Uh, no, I haven't. Oh, we got raided. What does that mean? <laughs> That's good. Uh, basically, uh, one Twitch user can, uh, when he ends the stream, he can jump off with all his followers over to another stream. Oh. And, uh, yeah. Min Mind Sketchbook just raided us with nine people. Hello. Nice. Yo. Um. Ba -da -ba -da -ba. Do you ever try out environments and landscapes? I do. Uh, sometimes. A little bit. Um, and I have ideas for some landscapes and some environments that I want to do. Uh, and it's purely down to me being kind of a lazy butt and having a bunch of stuff to do. But the short answer being I'm not doing as much as I should uh, and I want to do more, but I haven't. Are you happy now? <laughs> um... Hello, thanks for the streaming. Did you went through that phase where you don't progress anymore and you don't know what to do to get better? I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah, I think we've right all been there. Yeah. And I, I was definitely there when I got to Volta. Um, and to a degree when I left Volta. But in the meantime, I learned a lot about like studying and about um, this whole like demystification thing, right? So... Um, I think this idea of like not getting better is down to prioritization and vision. So if you're just saying, I want to get better, that's too abstract to be able to actually measure and figure out if you're getting any better. So I, I kind of reached an understanding of that when I was at Volta 
by watching like Ruangia draw because to him like he he had had such a lot of schooling in sort of in in painting techniques and in in uh, so sort of the academic aspect that he could kind of he could complete any drawing he could he could paint anything but he had a very specific set of uh, sort of source references in his head and so he would just he would sit down and do these like study marathons but he would just break down really quite complex stuff um quite uh simply with like he would he would limit himself for example to like straight line drawing or um intuitive sketches or like studies where he would just pick out like weird random elements from a reference and draw that um and that seemed really weird to me in the beginning but then i saw what he was doing which was like breaking down what he had been learning in terms of the academics and applying them to all these like different kinds of source materials so that he would gain new visual shorthands to use when he wanted to sketch for example dragons or or modern uh, soldiers or stuff like that you know like he would he wanted a wider range of uh, of references to play with more questions you hear me yeah okay um random question how much reading do you do every day and what exactly do you read um i think we have to so do yeah well i do about an hour a day um sometimes more sometimes less uh and right now i'm reading uh, gene wolf's uh severian of the guild I try to read a bunch of different stuff. Like I do, um, I also listen to a bunch of like news podcasts and science podcasts because these are things that I don't nat naturally gravitate towards, but I want to know more about. So, <clears throat> the Daily, for example, by I think that's Newsweek. No, Newsweek has the Intelligence, and then the Daily is the New York Times, I think. Um, and uh, one of the absolutely funniest sort of fake news podcasts ever is the Bugle. So listen to that pretty religiously. Um, and yeah, you know, I try and, and I try to like spend a couple of minutes reading, reading general news every day. You know, in a vain attempt at pre presenting myself as an adult. I know it's not working, but you know, I, I, I like to maintain the visage. Visage. A visage, indeed. Um. Yum yum yum. Mm, random question. We had that. Mm. How long have you been playing tabletop roleplay games like Dungeons and Dragons? Uh, one question before. Uh, we are at almost two hours. How long do you think you will go on? Holy shit! Oh, that went quick. Yeah. Um, we can go for another hour if you want. Another hour. Yeah. Or do you want to call it here and then we can <laughs> pick it up another day? Yeah. Probably. Uh, let's let's make another fifteen minutes and then just. All right. Yeah. That's cool. Now. Oh yeah, so Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, no, so I, I it took me a little bit of a while to get into D and D. That uh, just for for reasons of not having other people playing D and D. We played um, there was a Warhammer tabletop uh, role playing game, not the miniature game, but like I, I think it was like some some sort of offcast of D and D, but um, which we, we we played a bunch. I remember. Um, and I played Warhammer, uh, or rather, I collected Warhammer armies, uh, and I played the the Lord of the Rings tabletop strategy game. That one I actually played. Like Warhammer, I played one battle one time, but I collected one dwarf and one Bretonia army in in the process. So that was a that that was me figuring out that I preferred the drawings inside of the books to uh, to the game itself. So that was kind of the beginning and the end, at the end of that. But the the Lord of the Rings sort of tabletop battle game was easier for me to, to get on with. So I played that a little. Um, and I played Mord Mordheim, which was really fun. Um, smaller scale. So I did that from when I was about nine up till, well, up till now. So it's been some years. Again, a question by Boastful Baron. 
trying to get it together when all the job offers ask for an artist with job experience is sending your portfolio even if you have no experience a viable strategy yes yeah. and um i mean argue for the relevance of any experience you have if you think it's relevant so if you haven't got games industry experience then you might have you know in um ancillary experiences like you're working working in a team or working um under an art director or something that would show the client that you have some relevant experience i think part of the reason why people sort of ask for years of industry experience now is to kind of weed out the, the poor candidates and that's a that, that that's a calling sign that that the the industry is beginning to find saturations uh, but that's not permanent. It was like that a couple of years back too. And then it veered off and then it came back. So, um, specific experience is less important than quality of, uh, portfolio. So if you feel like you, you, you would fit well with a particular project, then I, I say send it. Like it doesn't really cost you much. Uh, and you know, apart from disappointment, but there's plenty of that in this industry. So might as well get on with it. <laughs> Ooh, that sounded grim. <laughs> <laughs> um uh what do we have here okay well, then we have i kind of skipped something okay hello what are your procreate settings for good printing quality and how many layers do you use usually thanks for the information oh uh so that is kind of a question better better served to spit it on them to me but i don't but, know what kind of settings you have so yeah so are you like my standard is depending on what i'm doing um for just like a sketch i usually just do an a4 page 300 dpi uh but if i'm working on something that i know is going to be printed then i usually work at least double that uh after some intense uh instruction from spit it on <laughs> please um anyway um but yeah i don't really have like one hard fast rule for that um but i try to uh, like never an under anything under 300 dpi at least uh i think you can answer better yeah. the question about the layers like how many layers you usually use oh um well that again like not really any hard fast rules there except for as few as possible kind of i try to I try to limit myself and to merge things down and keep my layer structuring pretty simple. Uh, seeing as it, it, it can it can both get chaotic and it can kind of divert attention from more important aspects. So as as often as I can, I try to I, I I merge down my layers and I simplify my layout and I will collapse large layer layer uh, like piles of layers. Um, just to keep my uh, my structure pretty simple. Um, my one suggestion for me is that if uh, when Evan makes a new piece and we're not sure where how it is printed, I usually advise him to go for A3. So eventually you can make a little poster from it. Um, but always go for 300 DPI, or classic stuff. Well, you can also work in RGB. Usually when you transfer things to um, to a company or if you have someone to lay out things with uh, as a book uh, they work with uh, jpeg rgb anyway and then it gets um, uh, transformed into cmyk while you uh, print out the pdf anyway so uh, there's not no real actual good printing quality setting for procreate just make the images big enough and you're good to go yeah Another question. Hello, apologies uh, from Jay. Um, although another question again, Evan. Um, the piece that you have produced, the pieces that you have produced are so nuanced and textured and seemingly are clearly informed and influenced through personal interests. How much would you say that these design sensibilities are the result of direct life experience or through the time spent engrossed with the, within the materials of others? And sourcing through those external observances that are so readily available within contemporary life without having to to the, the message ends 
Oh, well, I guess uh, if, if I understand correctly, it's a question about um, sort of like how to find applicable and good reference. This is so cool English. I wish I could talk like that. Like the way he rewrites the questions. <laughs> yeah, I, could never. I think I think um, an important thing to to do there is to kind of figure out the level of um, the, uh, the the approximation of reality that you're going for, how close to our own world you're trying to get, um, and the closer you are, the more the more specific you have to do. You're referencing the more specific you have to be in your designs so i think one of the things that makes that a good way of working is that it'll it'll naturally balance out the amount of studying you have to do to reach the goal that um your your, your previously set sort of approximation dictates um exactly how like there are no particular rules i can give you for for like sorting out the good from the bad in terms of reference apart from like i would say for example be careful with pinterest because it sidelines um uh, sort of you know real life uh, references with um other sort of fan things so, so for example it'll it'll have people doing cosplay and larping next to people doing medieval reenactment if you're looking for sort of fantasy and medieval references and that can be problematic because then you end up with people you know legit legitimately believing in uh leather plate armor and stuff like that and that doesn't really work um so having some fundamental instruction in you know the nature of art uh, the, the, the nature of uh armory and and arms and um Essentially, you know, the source material you're going to be working with is, um, I think, important to create an, an, an essential sort of um, authenticity. When you draw your characters' costumes, do you create them thinking of just shapes that you turn into clothing armor, or are you remembering things you have seen? A little bit of both. I start with the shape and then I just kind of layer on top of that uh, applicable or appropriate elements that I think would work well. Do you play computer games because they are a uh, time sink and I feel they get in way? I, I do. Uh, I've been playing a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit. The newest Total War game, which I gotta say, with the uh, with the Radius mod, is really good. It's kicking ass. But I, I had the like the the, van the vanilla felt ve very vanilla, but it's it's a good game. I think the important thing is to just like, yeah, uh, you have to you have to make it a treat for yourself. Like you you have to deserve it. That's been my kind of go to. So I, I I give myself permission to play when I have done enough work or done enough things in a day <coughs> to sort of warrant it. For some reason, my microphone seems to set itself back on some configuration always, and I'm getting low after. Oh, uh, you might, you, yeah, you might have uh, Skype hijacking your, your volume control. Skype. If you have Skype on. I know, yeah, I have Skype on, but we are not using Skype. We're using no, Skype. but as long as it's on, Skype will do that. We had a problem with that when setting up really? Backwater oh, Bastards. Shit. Yeah. Yeah, I just ended this. So let's see if it works. We will see. Um, there, was dro there was Dropbox too, I seem to remember, that did that. Dropbox, okay. For whatever reason. I don't know what Dropbox would be interested in that, but... For some reason, they are like like automatically like like adjusting it. I don't even mm -hmm. want that. Don't do this. Okay. Um, 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 I just ended. Um, oh, um, no, it's set back again. What the fuck? It. I just saw okay. it happening. Why? I don't. I don't know. It. But I've I've have seen this before. <laughs> like the song from, from uh, what's what's the name? Grace Jones. Do you know her? Mm, yeah, I know Grace Jones. Well, I know of Grace Jones. I've seen this before. Have you used service like? 
have you used services like Audible? It's been a great way for me to finish books. Hell yes! Oh, I love Audible. Um, I've been listening to yeah, I, I listen to a ton of books on Audible. Uh, so so that's a, that's a that's an absolute yes. Mm -hmm. I find um, that there's a bunch of books that I, I often have a hard time. Like I have a hard time reading Lovecraft, for example, because. He just like he goes off on these like tangents that I get so frustrated with. So that he's he's an example of something that's much easier to listen to than to read. So yeah, I I, I love me some Audible. Give me Audible. Um, you mentioned that something is academic. In what sense of the word are you using that? I don't assume you mean contemporary academic art. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, when I say academic, I mean something that can be studied and researched and and broken down into technical aspects. So when I say academic, I mean, uh, like I, I, I essentially just mean the 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 Loomis approach, the breaking things down into easily absorbable and understandable elements that you can redeploy at your whim. If that makes sense. Thoughts on Dallas, Dennis Villeneuve's Dune next year? Ooh, I'm excited. I I have had a lot of discussions about with a bunch of friends about how good the or bad the the, the new uh, Blade Runner movie was. I really liked it, but I have heard some legitimate critiques uh, that I halfway agree with at least but i am excited to see how how dune comes up that is going to be crazy fun i think alex heath is asking do you play hey. any board games if so do you have a favorite um <laughs> i haven't been doing a lot of board games but a friend of mine just bought the uh, settlers of Catan, so we're going to be trying that out uh so you know i'll i'll, I'll let you know how i find it mm-hmm <laughs> Um, anatomy books, I cover these usually. I'm already answering them. One question from me, Miguel Iglesias. If you had to choose a fantasy universe to live in for real, which one would it be? Ooh, oh. Um. <laughs> well, there's, so, there's so, so many I don't want to live in. Um. <laughs> anything medieval. Yeah. Anything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, because mass murder, my friend. Um. I suppose the Harry. I mean, it's provided I'm an, I'm a wizard. I guess the Harry Potter universe could be cool, depending a little bit on how how uh, how legitimately evil some people are. Like you know, they, they do go pretty far in describing like the Cruciatus Curse and stuff, and I wouldn't want that done to me. Um, oof, this is a difficult one to answer. Dune would be pretty cool, right? Ah, depends on the planet. I would never want to live on Arrakis. That's true. Hmm. Uh, but but like um, the oh, what's the planet that that Paul comes from? Caladon, is it something like that? That seems pretty sweet. Uh, but also it seems like a pretty terrible like empire to live in, especially when when Paul is emperor and his his son or grandson the god emperor that seems pretty awful so probably not that either um no I, I would say middle earth i'd love to be a hobbit <laughs> oh man dude hobbit in like the second age before shit gets real dark i wouldn't mind that at all It'd be a good hobbit sit and draw i'd yeah i'd, I'd, I'd out bilbo bilbo i think that would be my thing i want to be tom bombadil I've always wondered whether or not he's crazy. Like if he's so, if he's so old that he's like just legitimately like slightly. I don't know. He's you know, a, off he's his a rocker. god. So. Yeah, but I shit. mean, in in the in the world of Tolkien, who isn't a god these days? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um. Okay. Um. Blah, blah, blah. I need to go, Evan. Thanks a lot for clearing my doubts and answering my questions. Have a good stream, guys. Cheers. Okay, my little where, where do you get the information for a specific game project that companies might be looking f uh, for work for 
without connections in the industry? Uh, <laughs> that is a good question. I don't know. I think you need to have some connections in the industry. Yeah. I think you need to get yourself to some workshops and stuff. I mean, yeah. the, it's uh, my, my friend Rich. Rihanna uh, Muller had a very good um, saying that you know some people will say that it's not about what you know, it's about who you know, um, which is that, that that's a good point. Um, like, no matter how good you are, uh, you're not going to get far if people don't know that you can be as good as you can be. So you need to be out there and you need to make yourself known to these people. Yeah, I can confirm. Go to events. Yeah. Uh, da -da 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 -da. When do you know you are putting too much in a concept? When and you're no longer adding anything pertinent. And how you balance looking cool stuff with how you balance looking cool stuff with functional stuff. So I, I, I never emphasize cool because cool is just aesthetic combined with uh, context. So anything can be cool. So I focus on functionality and focus on concept. And then I will sort of re-emphasize cool when that becomes an issue. But literally, anything can be cool. It's just a question of how you treat it. So, yeah. Hmm. Hi, how was your experience with Wizards of the Coast? And at what point you thought your job was good enough to send them your portfolio? Thanks. <laughs> so, I, uh, I, I still love working with Wizards. It's great. Um, and I tried for like a year or so, actually probably, probably a little more, to get work for them by sending my stuff in. And I was sure that I was like good enough, but I kept kept getting those very nice go fuck yourself emails <laughs> where they're like, you know, like we have your work on file and you know, if anything comes up, we'll let you know. <laughs> Which is very nice the first time. And then the, you, you start like, I, I, do they just not like me? Uh, and then I moved to Denmark and uh, sh started sharing a studio with the Jesper Ising. And Jesper has been working for them for years and explained to me that part of the reason why I wasn't getting any luck with them was that um, they essentially just hire people who have been vouched for by another one of their already um, working freelancers. So uh, he asked me kind of offhandedly if I wanted to do some magic cards. And I was like, ah, yes, please. Um, but other than their kind of archaic and weird hi hiring policy, I really like working with them. For the most part, they have excellent art directors who know what to emphasize in feedback and who are fair and also really good. So it's, it's wonderful. I really like working with them. You seem to work so much, work so much, and also have free time. Do you ever, <laughs> you ever sleep? And how many hours? Uh, oh yeah, I love sleeping. Uh, yeah, I, I I do work quite a bit, but um, I try to, like I I found that it's not necessarily, or at least not entirely, about how many hours you put in, but how many hours you manage to stay productive. And so I, I try to be very succinct when I sit down to work, like what task am I sitting down to complete right now? <clears throat> and then once I've completed that task, I'll take a break and I'll go away and I'll specify another task to finish. That way I'm wasting very little money and um, very, very little time and time is money. Um, and I'll, I, I have a good sense of what I get done in a day. Um, I love the way you render your characters and the clothes. Oh, wait a second, we had this, I think. God, you studied to render material so effectively? I think, oh, you answered that earlier. Okay. Um, Hi, I'm a bit late, but I'm wondering, how do you divide your day? Means, uh, seems you play games, read books, and do lots of amazing art. Okay, I think that's pretty much what you just answered. Um, but, uh, but, uh, 
All right. You could always live in the Game of Thrones TV show world where teleportation <laughs> is possible. <laughs> That's true. That would be pretty baller. Uh, but also, apparently, people just have strange personality changes for no reason. So, you know, I don't know. I'd, I'd probably go pretty crazy pretty quick. <laughs> How do I get to these workshops on a limited amount of cash? You have to pick the ones that are not very expensive, like playgrounds, for example, where you have uh, like 75 euros for two days with a lot of uh, like-minded people. And um, yeah, that, that will bring you very far. You don't have to go uh, straight to the ones that cost a lot of money. Yeah, and I mean, there are a lot of workshops now and kind of all over yeah. the place. So. Um, if you're in the east, if you're in Eastern Europe, if then then there's a bunch both up in Russia and in in uh, Croatia. So there's a bunch of stuff. Um, and if you're in Western Europe, there are quite a few. And if you're in the Americas, there's a bunch. So you know, there's there really is stuff everywhere now. I just gave you the URL to the Fireside Mac, so you can have a little overlook, like where is what. Maybe there's something in your country. I live in the UK currently. There is a lot. Oh, in the, if uh, probably next year there will be industry workshops again. So go to that. It's yeah. it's simply the best. Do do do. Yeah, and um, hi Evan. So happy you're streaming. How do you achieve this pencil-like texture in Photoshop? Um. Well, drawing. I mean, I'm just using like a normal round brush. But I'm just drawing as if I was using a pencil, so I use that mentality. Uh, which I gotta say, that's one of the nicer things about uh, Procreate is that the feeling of the pencil on this iPad with uh, like a little screen protector on feels a lot like drawing, and the pressure sensitivity is very intuitive. So it, uh, yeah, it has very much has like the the feedback of of a pencil. So it's pretty easy to sort of get on with. My microphone is still adapting always, and I turned down um, Dropbox and Skype, and it's still happening. I don't know what the oh. fuck's going on. I will have well, to find We'll figure something. that out. Yeah. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Will you ever do portfolio reviews on stream? I think we talked about it, but yes, I think so. Yeah, we'll but do... probably just Patreon only. Yeah, so, you know, sign up for the Patreon and join it! Um. Blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking of trying. I think we would just make this the last. Uh, yes, okay. I am on Mac. Uh, we will make this the last question, I think. Well, let's let's do the last couple of questions. Just last so. couple. Are you almost yeah. finished, or what? Yeah, I mean, I could call this now, but uh, we can say you know we can we can say that this is you know the first part, and we can do another stream another day when I start doing college and stuff. But yeah, for now, I would say that this is pretty okay. Okay, well, I'm just saying like we don't have many other questions anymore. Oh, okay. So to take take what's left and then we go. Uh, I'm thinking of trying out preparing for a convention. Has Evan ever been to one with his art prints pre time maybe? Oh, uh, I've been to one big ass convention in America, uh, the CTNX, and I was I was there with Blizzard when I was there. So I wasn't I didn't bring any personal art. It was we were there as the Blizzard contingent. Um, but if I start, if, if for the next workshop or convention I go to, I'll definitely be bringing the books and some prints and stuff. So, yay! How do you achieve expression and life in each character? Uh, by kind of knowing what it is that I'm trying to do and then executing for that rather than for anything else. So. Um, I have to first think of like what's the mood and why, and then um, try and sort of be specific in, in the way that I try to depict both the mood and the reason for the mood, right? Or rather, like how that mood plays with the personality of the character that I'm making. Hi, Evan. Would you consider doing historically correct portraits of historical figures figures in the future? I mean, maybe um, depends a little bit on the on the figures, uh, but yeah, I mean, the the there is something about sort of the, the the less scrupulously studied periods of history that I find kind of interesting. So, like the late Roman period, for example, has a lot of cool 
fashion and clothing and armor stuff that I really like. Um, so I would at least consider doing some studies of, you know, historically correct reenactors who have studied that sort of thing. Um, I don't know uh, if I would do like a series of portraits or nothing about uh, historical figures, but maybe I would. If, you know, if they did like an illustrated version of, say, Khan Eagledon's books of like Genghis Khan or Julius Caesar, for example, uh, that'd be cool to do like a visual companion to that. Hmm. Could you elaborate a bit more on doing real work versus half effort work? Hmm? <laughs> I'm just reading. Could you elaborate a bit more on doing real work versus half effort work? Half effort work? Um, so, I mean, I think, I'm not sh entirely sure what that question refers to, but, um, so, half effort. I mean, I think what I would what I would equate that with would be sort of doing the stuff that you already know how to do, um, and sort of following formulaically with the um, with the way you've already figured out how to solve certain problems, rather than reapproaching the core of those problems and figuring out you know exactly how um, exactly what the problem is, and then trying to find new and better solutions. So I think. Um, there's a balancing act there between, you know, um, figuring out better and better ways of doing it and ending up like just doubting everything you do. So, yeah, I think that's <laughs> such a complex question. Um, I think the trick there is to be able to look at what you've done and have like an honest but not self-loathing um, review for yourself and seeing whether or not the way you did it was the better way of doing it or just the more lazy way of doing it. That at least has been my sort of issue with doing sort of left-hand work a lot as I end up sort of relying too much on, on um, things or solutions that I've already used like a little too much. And so my stuff starts ending up feeling like it's formulaic and boring to myself. It can be anything, like, uh, you know, that's particular light scheme or foot placement or stance or facial expression or angle. Like, there's a bunch of these little things where, um, you know, you can end up starting to feel insecure because you're repeating yourself too often. So I try... Very hard to sort of avoid that, but when I see myself doing it, I'm like, no, no, I'm getting predictable. Would you recommend any reference books for character design, clothing, etc. design? Uh, I think if you're doing sort of, if, I mean, since you're asking me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess that you're talking about something that has sort of that historical authenticity thing going. So in that case, I would say um, check out. Osprey Publishing. They have a ton of great books and a lot of illustrations by a guy called Angus McBride. If you can find his his uh, art anthologies too, they're great. Uh, Angus McBride. He is killer. So that's one. I think um, going to like historical museums and seeing, like if you have if if you're ever in London, for example, do not miss the chance to go to the Wallace Collection. That is eye opening about just just the applicability of armor design and you know a incredibly cool little ways of incorporating this and that and the other sort of little cultural details that have been turned into something useful in armor design so cool so the wall collection is definitely not to be missed Let's make the last question here. Ninja Please says, Hi again, by the time you started looking for freelance jobs, how did you move in this world? What would you suggest to someone who is ready to submit uh, his portfolio but don't know how to move in the right direction to start working as an artist? Thanks. Oh, uh, so there's a bunch of wonderful websites. Like ArtStation, for example, has a lot of these um, portals. and. CG Hub before them used to have a freelance hub for that. I don't know if ArtStation has anything similar, but um, essentially make it known 
make it sure that you know put it in your instagram profile profile and stuff that you're you're looking for stuff and then send your profile no you send your portfolio out wide to you know possible clients and to people who might be able to put you into contact with possible clients um and show your ability to solve as varied and as deep a set of problems as possible so that people who do see your work see you know the possible qualities of hiring you um my short question is here how do you spell that museum that you mentioned in london oh the wallace as in william wallace though that's not the same wallace but that's how you spell it so w-a-l-l-a-c-e collection I found a URL. Yeah, okay. Beat me to it. All right. I think uh, we called it a day, right? Yeah. Unless there are any more questions, I think we are not. Mm. We're done. It's uh, okay. it's two and a half hours so far. <laughs> All right. You're too late. But yeah, this was fun. So we should, uh, we should try and make this a weekly thing, I guess. Yeah, right. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Cheers.